And welcome to another in the series of the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, seminars delivered from the Institute of Health Studies in Plymouth. Last time in this series, we enjoyed receiving information from Dr. Morag Prowse from the Institute at Plymouth regarding the treatment of morbid obesity and the NICE guidelines relevant to the subject. If you missed that, don't worry, there are video copies available of that session for viewing. These copies, and those of other IHS seminars, are kept on each site for perusal and teaching purposes. This month's NICE seminar will be delivered by another of our Institute of Health Studies colleagues, Jennifer Caverne. Jennifer, who is Senior Lecturer at Exeter, will consider the NICE guidance on the use of debriding agents and specialist wound care for difficult to heal surgical wounds, plus the clinical guideline on the pressure ulcer risk assessment and prevention. Jennifer's presentation will be followed by studio and site discussion. Joining us to assist in our discussions are two experts in the field. Maya Fear, Tissue Viability Nurse Specialist for Plymouth Primary Care Trust, South Hams and West Devon PCTs. And Martin Butcher, Skin and Wound Care Service Manager and Clinical Nurse Specialist at Plymouth Hospitals Trust. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here. I'm also very aware that there's considerable further experience and interest locally in both the Institute of Health Studies and the wider peninsula. Those of you who fall into this group, please do make contact with your comments and queries to add to our debate. The telephone number to call is 01752 233 646 and the email address is studio at plymouth.ac.uk. Calls will be received following the presentation which will be about half past two. Please do share your thoughts, your contributions are most valuable. Now, without further delay, I'd like to hand over to Jennifer. Hello, good afternoon. For the first part of this presentation, I'm going to be looking at the research-based evidence that supported the development of the NICE guidance on debriding agents and specialist wound care clinics for difficult to heal surgical wounds. And then I'll be looking at the evidence for the, the inherited guideline on pressure ulcer risk assessment and prevention. When um, constructors of guidelines, when authors of guidelines on the clinical effectiveness of a treatment or an intervention, what they want to find is good quality randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials that produce valid, unbiased and robust evidence for the effectiveness of the particular intervention or treatment. A randomized controlled trial is a trial in which subjects are randomly assigned to either the experimental group, the intervention group, or the, treat or the control group, and then the outcomes, the dependent outcomes, are, are compared between the two groups. One thing that will set the um, authors fire, uh, would really like their fire, is to find systematic reviews, that is a collection of um, randomized controlled trials that is going to provide good, sound, quality evidence for the particular intervention that they are planning. Systematic reviews are important because they have very clear selection um, criteria, they're very comprehensive, and they also use explicit guidelines on how they appraise the information, the studies, for methodological rigor. When we're looking at um, evidence for the development of guidelines, often people talk about a hierarchy or a continuum of different levels of evidence, and right at the top what researchers really want to find, or what guideline constructors really want to find, is strong evidence from at least one systematic review of randomized controlled trials that support the intervention and that there is a low risk of bias in those studies. And going down the scale, we move from strong evidence from well-designed randomized controlled trials 
to descriptive studies and evidence that is perhaps more informal and based on the clinician's expert opinion, clinical experience, and so on, um, evidence from expert committees. So looking at the, first of all, the background to this study, the um, use of debriding agents and specialist wound care clinics for difficult to hit, heal surgical wounds. The technology appraisal document talks a great deal about the factors that, that provided the rationale for the development of this guideline. First of all, um, delays most surgical wounds heal normally and quite quickly, but delays to healing are caused by a number of factors. Um, intrinsic factors such as the, the patient's um, uh, any other existing morbidity such as diabetes, um, their, their nutritional status, um, their circulation, their age and so on, and local factors um, to do with the development of material or infection within the wound. We have no reliable epidemiological data on the number of, of surgical wounds that become difficult to heal. There are around 6 million surgical wounds every year in the NHS in England and Wales, and it is estimated that there are probably 21,000 become difficult to heal for a variety of reasons, but that could be an underestimate. The reviewers also noted that the care of these patients is shared between the hospital and the community, but with a growing trend to um, care provision within the community, and that pr practitioners looking after these wounds require access to high levels of knowledge and skill and advice from a variety of clinical disciplines and believe that maybe we should have expert services for the most intractable of wounds. Debridement is literally the removal of debris, devitalized necrotic tissue, infected tissue or fibrin from a wound. And there are different methods of debridement. Um, surgical methods, um, excising the, the um, material from the wound, chemical methods, mechanical, uh, biosurgical, and autolytic. Autolytic, which is a method which promotes the body's own autonomous debridement and wound healing processes. There are a range of wound care products that are thought to promote autolytic healing. Um, alginate dressings, different foam dressings, um, various types of dressings which collectively are known as modern dressings. And related to debridement is the frequency with which um, the, the dressings are changed and the patient's acceptability of the, the particular type of dressing that they are being required to use. The actual cost to the NHS of these difficult to heal surgical wounds has not been measured. As I've said, the epidemiology is quite poor, but there is a growing awareness that the healthcare costs are not only the unit cost of the dressing, but also the frequency that that dressing needs changing, that is the, the cost of the nurse's time quite often over a period of time, and also cost to the patients themselves. So the number of patients affected is not known, and we do know that clinical practice varies, and also the reviewers were aware that in the future we are likely to see more difficult to heal surgical wounds with radical surgery, the aging population, um, and also the, the um, reality of hospital acquired infections. So to look at the treatment, the debriding agents for difficult to heal surgical wounds, the NICE commissioned um, what they described as a rapid, a rapid systematic review. And like all good systematic reviews, there were very clear objectives. The first was to determine the clinical and cost effectiveness um, of debriding agents in the treatment of these particular wounds. And like all good systematic reviews, the reviewers were looking at very clear cut um, focus. They had to be this particular type of surgical wound. Any other surgical wound was eliminated from their search. There had to be clear specification of wound healing rates. And the um, reviewers, when they um, looked at studies, there were two independent reviewers and a third person to, was consulted um, in order to achieve consensus. 
The second objective was to evaluate the clinical and cost effectiveness of treating patients in specialist wound care clinics. When the um, reviewers of the systematic review looked at the evidence, they were using two outcomes, wound healing and cost, and they found 17 trials, all using autolytic methods of debridement. But only 13 of those were considered um, useful for this particular type of wound. And they looked at wounds such as perineal wounds, um, abdominal breakdown in abdominal wounds, pinodial sinuses, abscesses, and so on. They, so they looked at different um, types of wound, different types of um, surgical, um, surgical dressing, and many of the studies just looked at one method of treatment. In three studies, they compared one surgical um, dressing with another. Only three of the 13 studies compared the different type of um, secondary, um, I'm sorry, the different type of modern dressing. They didn't find a single study that investigated other types of debridement, such as surgical, um, in difficult to heal surgical wounds. All trials um, were looking at autolytic methods of debridement. The quality of the evidence was considered in the technology appraisal document. Many of these studies had methodological flaws. In particular, um, the small sample sizes for, for the studies was noted with a median of 43. And in the total of 13 um, controlled trials, there were less than 500 patient subjects. Many studies, it was found, did not report how they randomized patients to the treatment group or the experimental group, and neither did they report whether the assessors of the outcome measures, whether they had been blinded as to which particular group the subjects had been allocated to. Again, many studies didn't report the important um, baseline characteristics of the wound, how um, severe the wound was before they started the treatment. Neither did they report on relevant patient characteristics, such as their age or clinical condition, which are likely to affect um, the, the, the healing time of their wound. Other limitations were that the, when they calculated healing times, they often didn't give a very clear result. Many studies used um, a mean rather than a median, which was um, affected by extremes of the outliers in their results. And also, if the wound didn't heal at all, then it was very difficult to calculate mean healing times. And finally, the statistical test that they used to compare the effectiveness of the treatment compared to the control group were often not very clearly reported. So it was not possible to pull um, the, the results of the study and to provide a, a, a meta-analysis of the effectiveness. So therefore, the results of these studies should be interpreted with caution due to their relatively poor quality and the unknown effects of potential confounding factors which could bias the results. Looking at clinical effectiveness, they couldn't find any uh, controlled trial that demonstrated that one type of modern dressing was superior to another. There was, however, some evidence to suggest that patients would prefer one type of dressing to another, particularly in more subjective um, assessments of pain um, dressing and dressing performance, the management of exudate, and that kind of thing. But because these studies were unblinded, these secondary benefits were felt possibly to, have be, to be um, perhaps biased. In relation to cost effectiveness, there were only four economic evaluations, um, no evaluations comparing the two different types of modern dressing or of specialist wound clinics. There were no evaluations of the, effect of the cost effectiveness of wound clinics. There was some evidence that modern dressings um, are lower in cost, partly because they required less frequent changing. But it should be stressed that the quality for the effectiveness of cost and clinical effectiveness analysis was poor. So in the guidance, they're saying there's no evidence for any particular method of debridement, but that modern dressings may reduce pain and be acceptable to patients. 
The choice of guidance, they concluded, should really be on patient acceptability and minimizing cost. So therefore, um, if one type of treatment was no more or less effective than another, then cost minimization was a suggested criterion of choice. And that the, the treatment of these patients required a structured, multi-professional approach to care. There was a lot of implications mentioned regarding future research. Um, the reviewers would like to see more multi-centre trials comparing different types of modern dressing, economic evaluations of modern dressings, research into other debriding methods, and also studies looking at clinical and cost effectiveness of specialist wound care clinics, and more epidemiological research on the prevalence and cost to the NHS of these particular types of surgical wound. Turning now to the, to the second um, guideline, this is a, the NICE guidance on um, pressure ulcer risk assessment and prevention. This is an inherited guide, guideline, um, inherited from the Royal College of Nursing, and it was developed by a multi-professional group of people, including carers and users. The guideline had three aims. The first was to provide a good means for assessing those at risk of pressure ulcer development and to provide an understanding of the effective interventions for preventing pressure ulcer development. And thirdly, to reduce the likelihood of unproven or harmful methods of assessment and prevention. This was a particularly complex guideline because what the, the authors were trying to do was to identify several links, several criteria that would relate to the assessment and the management um, in, in the prevention of, of pressure ulcers. And so they identified nine separate criteria. And for each criterion, they were looking for evidence, both informal evidence in terms of um, best practice and also formal evidence in terms of um, a, a sound, robust research base. They had their own scales for evaluating the evidence. The first one was generally good, uh, consistent finding in a majority of acceptable studies. The second level was um, based on a single acceptable study or weak and inconsistent findings from a number of acceptable studies. And thirdly, where there was limited scientific evidence which doesn't meet the criteria of acceptable, or, of acceptable studies, they would include expert opinion. So the guideline development team described themselves as a nominal group and they worked towards a, a formal consensus development and their aim was to, to uh, find and appraise and then to integrate the different evidence sources and where there was a weak research base to agree recommendations based on current best practice. Two clinical issues out of that n the, the list of, of nine um, levels, or, or I'm sorry, nine criteria that they were looking at, there were only two clinical issues where they could find a systematic review to provide evidence at level one. The first one was on risk assessment scales, where they found studies that had fairly clear cut criteria for selection of patients, the um, the design of the studies, the follow-up criteria, and the measurement and tests of reliability. And the other um, source of evidence, the other type of uh, criterion for which they had evidence, was on pressure redistributing devices, and they found two systematic reviews for that. The remaining level of evidence for, to support this guideline was appraised at level three. Looking at the two systematic reviews, the authors reported that on the whole, they were of fairly poor quality. The sort of things that they identified as being weak um, was, for example, a lack of baseline comparability um, between the two groups or the um, measurement of the problem in the first place, 
There was a very poor description of the ALSA assessment. Um, lack of blinding in the studies as reported in, in the other guidance. Um, often inadequate sampling and attention to randomization. And in particular, in the first study, the first systematic review on pressure ALSA assessment, many studies gave little attention to inter-rater reliability, which is very important. In other words, studies that were looking at assessment scales, they didn't, um, often didn't report whether there was reliability between the assessors. So based on, on that sort of cautious appraisal of the evidence, through the, the process of um, consensus development of the guideline, they felt that there was some research evidence that could be translated into recommendations. First of all, that there's insufficient evidence to recommend using risk assessment scores on their own, and that decisions should be made based on holistic assessment of an individual individual patient's risk. And secondly, there is evidence to support the recommendation that individuals at risk of developing pressure ulcers should not be placed on standard foam mattresses. And there were also recommendations for future research. So in the publication of the guidelines, each of the nine issues are identified, the recommendations are made, and then the levels of evidence to support that those recommendations are often given and they often refer to the consensus development and the expert opinion. The recommendations for future research include, um, it, it's very, very large. They include more attention to methodological standards throughout, the need for well-designed, independent and multi-centered randomized controlled trials of the different types of pressure devices in a different variety of settings. And, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, well, back to me. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny, for um, a very helpful presentation. It's now um, our opportunity to discuss some of the issues that um, Jenny has referred to and your opportunity to phone in with any queries in relation to Jenny's presentation or indeed wider issues in relation to tissue viability. Telephone number on the screen. Do give us a call. I wonder if I can start off following um, Jenny's um, final comments there in relation to some of the future research that's required and whether indeed in the southwest there is already research happening, whether there's already research planned to tie in with the recommendations, identifying that we look, need to look across multi-centres through randomised controlled trial approaches to, to get the information that we need. Perhaps I can start with Martin. Have you got...? Well, uh, certainly there's uh, great plans to move things forward. The tissue viability nurses in the southwest form together in a regional group. Um, between us, we're aiming to set up studies in the next year or two to actually start moving things forward as a multi-centred trial site. Uh, we feel that we've got an ideal opportunity to do that in that we have a good client group, we have a good group of um, tissue viability nurses, and we've already got a, a good deal of expertise in the southwest. Excellent. I might come and pick that up a little bit further sure. in a moment, but I gather we um, already have a phone call. We have Plymouth on the line. Hi, it's, uh, it's, it's Ray Jones here from, from Reynolds Jordan in Plymouth. Hello, Ray. Um, excuse my ignorance, but I was wondering, what, what's maggots got to do with all this in terms of the... Uh, um, the first systematic review. I mean, do maggots come into the cleaning of wounds? If I can answer <laughs> that, yes, yes. Um, they do come very much into the removal of devitalized tissue from wounds, particularly where there is soft, sluffy material. Then they have been proven to be very effective, very efficient, and unfortunately, the nice guidelines came out just before the clinical research that showed the cost effectiveness, demonstrated the cost effectiveness when compared with hydrogels in the same uh, situation. So, and we are, we are actually using them, Martin used them in the hospital in Plymouth, and we actually now use them in the community and community hospitals. So d does that mean then that uh, you know, one, one of the future lines of research might be to, to compare that with some of the things already in the NICE guidelines? 
Yes, so some of that research has been done and, and a lot of it continues to be ongoing. Um, the research laboratory that has developed the biosurgical unit and the, the use of maggots collects a database on a regular basis from people who are using the therapy and they're building that up to find more um, where the, the therapy is most useful and where it's most cost effective and that continues as, as we go through. In fact, we're actually looking ourselves, and Martin and I were discussing earlier, um, a project that we have lined up to start probably in the new year looking at um, the use of maggots, larva therapy, in debridement of particularly chronic wounds where patients have a minimum blood supply because as Jennifer pointed out to us, with a lot of the products, you need a blood supply in order to help them to work efficiently. Maggots don't need a blood supply. Does that help you, Ray? Yep, he's gone. Okay, I wonder if I can um, follow that up a little further. One of the points um, that Jenny made when she was referring um, particularly to the first set of guidelines um, was in relation to um, the choice of mm. guidance and focused on patient acceptability. Do patients accept larva therapy? Yeah, I mean, I, Martin sort of aims towards me because I do use, we use a fair amount of, of larva therapy within Plymouth Primary Care Trust and South Hams and West Devon um, Care Trust. And usually I have I found I have been asked by the mm. patient for the therapy. And I think, Martin, yeah. your experience has probably I'd, been the same. I'd certainly concur with that. Um, the majority of patients that we've used larvae on in the hospital, and there's been a, a large number now, have actually asked for it. They, they yeah. see it every week in Women's Realm or mm. um, on the, in The Guardian or whatever else. It, it's very big on the media these days. Uh, and people ask for that. I think the big issue, if I can come back a little mm. bit, um, the guidelines were set out for acute surgical wounds. And I think this has been one of the problems with the guideline. It wasn't looking at the chronic wound. And many forms of, of um, debridement that we use are in fact for chronic mm. wounds mm. rather than the acute wound. Um, and that's probably a f possibly a failing as such in the guideline itself. Mm. If it had a wider brief looking at chronic wound management mm. as well, then I think we would have had a guideline that was actually mm. more user friendly mm. and, mm. and actually covered a lot more mm. of the patients that we're, yeah. we're likely to come across. And is there a plan to introduce a secondary guideline to look at the chronic? Certainly there's been work done. Uh, the Centre for Dissemination has actually um, looked at chronic wound management. Right. Um, I don't know if NICE are taking that on board. Right. And Jenny, you referred earlier when you were talking um, about the data that had been collected that actually there was very little um, evidence on surgical debridement for yes. um, difficult yes. to heal surgical yes. wounds. Yes, I mean, the, I think because of the very strict criteria they were using, what they were focusing on, difficult to heal surgical wounds, and then the studies had to have a very clear measurement of healing and so on. So a lot of studies that may have covered these topics, mm -hmm. particularly with the biosurgical, me the biosurgical methods, the use, of, the use of, of, of maggots, is that because they weren't looking at these particular wounds, they were excluded. Mm -hmm. And that they, they weren't finding studies that were targeted to, the, to this particular focus of difficult to heal surgical wounds. So there may have been studies of surgical methods of deprivement of leg ulcers or chronic wounds or other types of wounds, but not on this particular type. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Martin, I wonder if I can ask you to um, share with us what you believe some of the local challenges are with regards to implementing the guidelines. Um, if we're talking here just the, de the debridement yeah. issues. Um, there are numerous issues, I think, with that. Um, there are a wide variety of choices available to us um, as far as debriding agents, and I think you're quite right in saying that the, the guidelines highlighted that there hasn't been an awful lot of information showing one is better than the other. I think most clinicians would, rec would recognize that surgical debridement is probably the, the most effective as far as time goes, but it's a costly option mm. if you're taking patients to theatre. Um, many healthcare professionals, however, do bedside conservative debridement, sharp debridement yeah. with instruments, and that raises a whole range of issues about the uh, extended role 
of, um, of all practitioners. Medical staff are trained in, in sharp debridement. Um, podiatrists are trained, but nurses aren't necessarily. And although historically nurses have actually carried out sharp debridement, there are big issues about patient safety. And that's certainly something that's been fairly high on the agenda recently. As far as topical measures uh, and dressings, I think there are lots of issues regarding cost effectiveness mm. and patient acceptability. Larval therapy is probably the second fastest debriding action for most patients, second to sharp debridement. However, there are obviously some patients who that is not appropriate yeah, sure. for and who f succumb to the yuck factor. Mm. So you have to have a choice of, of options there and no one system is going to work for all patients. What about hyper hyperbaric therapy? Hyperbaric therapy um, works by increasing the amount of oxygen in the tissues um, and can speed um, white cell action. Now white cells as we know are essential as debriders. However, um, for pure debridement, hyperbarics is not really an indication. Okay. Can I then move to Maya and ask a similar question with regards to um, the pressure ulcer risk assessment and prevention mm -hmm. guideline? Yes. What are going to be some of the challenges in implementing that? Um, I think some of the challenges were that we'd already started looking at developing our own guidelines um, but waiting for the NICE guidelines to come out and fortunately a lot of what w the work we'd already achieved is within the NICE guidelines. Right. So that was good. I mean, both Martin and I have, have had um, focus groups within our own areas so that we haven't been dictating our guidelines. We've been looking at what they require as well in order to help them to implement. So we've been linking it very much towards the essence of care document, right. about benchmarking, about what the requirements are in order to make sure that we can achieve best practice and as far as the risk assessment is concerned then yes we have remained closely with water low risk assessment but realize that it is only a tool that is used to indicate it, it, it's not going to actually tell you exactly which person is going to break down but it is an indicator right. it's an aid memory. Now I wonder if I can pick you up there because we have a question from Bobman that's been emailed mm -hmm. through and um, it relates to the risk assessment um, scorings and Waterfield, I mean are Waterloo. we still using, Waterloo. Waterloo sorry, are we still using um, Norton scales in the no. area? Um, I think in Plymouth, then I'd, I'd say no, right. in the majority of cases. Um, I know that within the hospitals trust, although they're using, you are using Waterloo, mm. you actually have another one that you use on maternity, yeah. so that is specific right. for patients' needs. The question from Bobmin is, what are some of the factors um, considered for risk assessment scoring within the tools? Um, the the various risk assessments that are considered within, within the tools are about um, continence, about the, the patient's body weight, about their mobility. And what we've tried to do when we've been developing our guidelines is to say it is not just a number crunching exercise. What we've actually done is develop flow charts to say, look at this, consider the risk factor, but also consider these other things, yes. particular to our patient clientele, requirement yes. and that's what we've done is, is link that to that. Which indeed is leading you to the holistic assessment yes, that because is suggested. Yeah, yeah. everyone is, is different and that's why we've had to look at our equipment differently because our requirement in specific clinical areas are always going to be different, yes. slightly different. And I'm right in thinking that the Waterloo tool also prompts you with regards to the chosen type of mattress for example that you might utilise it really prompts you as to the level of risk, perceived yeah. right. risk, and from that you take mm. your, your assessment. Right. Um, I think there are a, a number of issues, as, as Myra has pointed out. That, um, risk assessment tools are only as good as the people, people that are using them. Mm. Um, and as has been highlighted within the NICE guidelines, there are two stages to risk assessment. There's the informal and the formal. I think for too many years people have been hung up on the formal risk assessment. I, you've got to get the numbers down, you must get the numbers down. 
really that is only one part of it. We need nurses to actually start to use their minds a little bit. I'm not saying they don't, but um, a lot of people can be blinded by the number and forget about some of yeah. the obvious things. Almost as though the number right. so yeah. avoids one looking That's laterally right. at, at some of the wider issues. At the end of the day, we have to look at using <coughs> resources. And mm. part of that is our nurses' time. Is it appropriate for us to actually spend time doing a risk assessment on somebody who, uh, and a formal risk assessment, on somebody who obviously is not at risk? You've got a young man comes in for a minor operation, um, a day case procedure, he's going to be um, going into theatre for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Is it appropriate for us to actually do a formal risk assessment tool? And certainly NICE seem to be heading towards that isn't an appropriate use of resources. An informal risk assessment tool would be, to, would be completely... Right, that's lovely. It leads me beautifully into another question that's just come from Tor Bay, which says, is there anything for the patient to do in all this? Mm. So what do we do with regards to patient education? What about this young man who needs perhaps an informal risk? Is some earlier education required to ensure that we don't have to put in so much resource on arrival for the surgery? I think as far as, I mean, if we're talking about the young man, then, I mean, for most young men, I think, going in for an operation, the, the, the big thing would be that they would want to be out of it as soon as possible <laughs> and get back, to, you know, to normal everyday living. Um, but as far as uh, patients who perhaps have an element of risk, then it's about involving the carers, involving them, telling them about what can be the problem, what are the risk factors, and how they can help themselves to reduce them. Mm. And that again is something that both Martin and I have mm. included in our policies, including booklets that you can mm. pass to patients, it can be reinforcing what uh -huh. the nurse has already said and how they can be looking at moving themselves. I mean, I appreciate we're sitting in the studio now in one position and it doesn't take very long before you're thinking, I hope somebody else goes on the camera so I can move position Absolutely. and this this is exactly yeah. what you're going to be doing when you're teaching your patients whether formally or informally. I mean, the, the guidelines have um, been quite specific but mm. care is about a, a partnership between us as healthcare providers and, and the patient and their informal carers and when it comes to risk assessment and actually acting on that risk assessment we have to actually involve all the parties in that Mm. And that means that patients need to be empowered, they need the information, um, and then they need to make decisions themselves, and we need to work in conjunction with them through that. And that's certainly something that I think tissue viability nurses across the country are working towards, to actually empower patients to make decisions, giving them the information that they need, um, so that we can actually support them. The days of matron coming, I hate to use the term now, saying we have them back with us now. <coughs> the matron coming along and telling you, you must, you must get out of bed every, every hour, you must have this or that done, it, I think have, uh, are gone. We need to work in partnership. Working in partnership with regards to clinical risk. What about working in partnership with regards to the research that's required? Are we not quite there yet with this? I'm a little surprised um, from Jenny's uh, resume of um, some of the, the work that's been done mm. that we flagged in such a pivotal area mm. that the research is actually still quite poor. I, I think you need to think about the client group that are involved. Um, if we're looking at pressure ulcers, if we're actually looking at the, let's say, the, the treatment of pressure ulcers, you often have a group of, of clients there who would be excluded from randomised mm. controlled mm. studies. They have too mm. many comorbidities. Mm. Um, if we're looking at debridement, um, there are many different types of patients with many different types of problems, and it would be impossible to get a randomised controlled study done on most of those sort of scenarios. Mm. So we have to look at possibly poor quality evidence, which is, but is very legitimate evidence. We need to look at large cohort studies, possibly. Right. And then look at the individuals within that, and then the yeah. subgroups within that. And that's something that a randomised control study doesn't necessarily do. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to stop you there. I gather we have a call from Plymouth. Hello, Val and Hello, Jennifer Anne. and everybody on the, um, the, the panel. I've got a question about um, looking at environmental factors, in particular how the tissue viability teams 
working with the control of infection teams as an issue to do with um, surgical wounds and etc. healing, particularly in, at the moment as um, the increase in infections within hospital acquired infection rates are increasing. So can you just capture your question again for us, Anne? Right. How do the team, the petition viability team, see themselves working with the control of infection teams to address some of the environmental issues that may impact on um, wound infections and, and control of the same? Thank you. Okay. Um, I think it's a union which needs to be developed and moved on. In some areas in the country, there's an extremely close links, i.e. you have a... Uh, a nurse specialist in both tissue viability and infection control. North Devon is one of those. Andrew runs both services. Other parts of the country um, have different services with nurses looking just at tissue viability or looking at infection control. Whichever system you have, you need to work together for, for the patients. Um, I think if we're looking, for instance, at pressure ulcers, one of the issues that's been raised recently is about mattresses. We know mattresses can be a, or poor quality mattresses, can be one of those things that lead to pressure ulcer development. We can put business cases together to get mattress replacement programs in hospitals, but unless we actually work together in, and try to put a combined business case together, which shows that it's not just about pressure relief, it's about infection control issues, mm -hmm. the mattress has a reservoir for bacteria, then we're probably not going to move on. Okay, thanks. Was that it, Anne? Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. We've had another question um, for Plymouth in relation, uh, from Plymouth rather, in relation to the patient education. And the query is, is there a possibility for trials of different forms of patient education and their effects on subsequent mm. healing? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> nice question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, there is, I suppose there is the possibility. I mean, what has happened over the years is that a number of people have asked different, um, have devised different information booklets for patients. The trouble is that they haven't looked into the other research that surrounds that, which is in regard to how big do you make the print? What colours do you put in there so that people can notice? And, but some booklets have been developed along those lines. The problem is that because of the expense of the booklets, then they're normally sponsored by companies who contain a fair amount, Mr. Martin, of, of their of their products involved in it. Which, and we are always so careful about making sure there is no bias. As far as making sure that the, the patients can understand them and that they are going to benefit from them, then yes, a number have had audits performed on them to see whether they are acceptable and whether the patient had a better um, idea of the problem after reading them. Our concern as well is, do they come in different languages? And for the majority, they are in English and it's very expensive to get them translated. Um, the future research on that, well, there is a potential for it, but it would be rather a big piece of research and if somebody is interested in in carrying it out, I could always provide them with some of the booklets, mm. and I'm sure Martin <laughs> could as well. Yeah, I mean, it would be most like interesting, wouldn't it? Yes. Because yeah. I mean, we all refer back to our student days and consider the pieces of research along yeah. the lines of information and prescription against mm. pain and, mm. and so forth. Mm. And uh, I'm, I'm sure, absolutely right, Plymouth are in that there is a place mm. um, here for that sort of um, piece of work to be undertaken. Communication is a big factor, I think, in your risk assessment and in the care that you're delivering to your patient and what's happening as well as the carers and the family, it does very much come down to communication. There was an area that um, one of the consultants at the workshop this week um, discussed, that we discussed at the workshop in relation to pressure ulcer development and that was when patients are transferred from within departments, for mm. example waiting on trolleys for radiotherapy. Um, I know there is some research about the development of pressure ulcers or the risk of pressure ulcer development in theatre. But things right. like x-ray and, and radiotherapy in these kind of areas, that we did feel we do need more research yeah. on that and perhaps yeah. some observational studies of what actually happens when patients are transferred from bed to trolley to another department and back again, and which seems to be an area when patients do develop or could 
be at greater risk of developing yeah. pressure ulcers. And we may need a bit more evidence about what's going on there. And that was just one area of research that uh, was identified by the consultant this week. Mm. One of the things that came up from that as well is that, that there has been work done. I mean, Bridal did the mm. work in, in theatres. The theater. And I think that some of that has been taken up within interdepartmental uh, studies and particularly with tissue viability nurses working within the acute sector because a lot of what that showed mm -hmm. was in regard to manual handling about the shear, the friction, mm -hmm. particularly when patients were being moved. So there's a link as well within tissue viability with infection control as, as was mentioned earlier but also with manual handling yeah, issues definitely. and making sure that they are right. Mm -hmm. I, th I think from the hospital point of view, it's often easier to do these sort of studies than it is in the community setting, mm. because you have, to a certain extent, got a captive audience. Um, it certainly fits in very much with the way healthcare has been delivered recently. If we're looking at acute admissions, uh, particularly planned admissions, we now look at pre-assessment clinics. And it would be possible mm. for us to actually set up trials looking at the information that's given in pre-assessment clinics. Um, to enable people to be prepared before they come yes. into the hospital. Mm. Um, I can think of a classic example that we have, uh, or we had a little while ago, was that patients coming in for orthopaedic surgery for knee and hip replacements, we as clinicians know have problems with swollen legs post-operatively, but so many of them actually came in with brand new slippers, because it, you know, they're coming into the <laughs> hospital must have new slippers. Yes, of course. <laughs> and the new slippers don't fit once you've got a swollen foot. Um, and it had a direct link then to the development of heel sores in these patients where their feet were in slippers that were too tight, so they didn't wear them, uh, or they moved the back off, so they were then sitting with their feet on hard floors. And that was a very basic issue about educating people during their pre-assessment clinic. Mm. And that fits in very nicely. Now, it's not work that's been done t to date, but I think it's certainly a research project mm. that could be undertaken yes. quite, quite easily. Very much so. I've got Plymouth again on the line, I believe. Hi there, Plymouth. Um, hi, hi, uh, hi Val, Ray. everybody there. Um, just kind of carry on with that, that conversation. It's really, it's, um, really interesting, the, this stuff about the education for patients, information for patients. Um, the, the booklets that are available, are they sort of fairly standard? I mean, ha and the information that you want to get across, is it fairly standard or are there, or is there a lot of variation between different client groups and between different people? Mm. The, the thing I'm wanting to get at really is, is there a role for trying to personalise the information to particular patients, or at least mm. at least particular patient groups, or is the information very very standard? Mm. Um, there's certainly a Department of Health um, booklet, a very a fairly basic one. I might, might hasten to add, but it's a fairly basic book which gives an overview of what pressure ulcers are and an understanding a little bit more about pressure ulcers, and that's probably a good starting point. But I think that there is a, a role for um, individualised information sheets for certain client groups. In Plymouth we've done a lot with um, women during the perinatal period um, because we recognised that there was a problem with some women developing pressure ulcers during labour um, and so we've done some targeted work specifically at that group. There are other groups like children uh, who are not considered normally a high-risk group but we know that there are, there are children that develop pressure ulcers. Um, now we have more children with that are surviving chronic diseases, uh, diseases where they would have had a very short life before are now surviving into their teenage years and into adulthood. Mm. And they're going to be at much higher risk than they ever were before. And to my knowledge, um, certainly in the Southwest, we don't have a, uh, an information sheet specifically designed for that group. I know though there are areas like Great Ormond Street that have gone along that route. I think there is a role for sharing information um, and it's going to be down to things like the national associations the Wound Care Society, Tissue Viability Society, Tissue Viability Nurses Association to actually help coordinate that sharing of ideas. Does that help you, Ray? Uh, thanks. Yeah, well, can, I, can I just sort of follow that? Please do. Uh, I mean, you talk about different particular groups. Uh, well, what about particular patients? I mean, uh, is there a case where maybe somebody, you know, has a certain uh, other comorbidities, for example, mm -hmm. where they they may have to do something different from a patient who doesn't have those comorbidities. Uh, the, the thing I'm getting at is that um, we've done some quite a lot of work um, before coming coming here, and I hope to carry on here in trying to personalise information according to people's own particular medical history. Is yeah. that something that we worth pursuing? Do you think in, in this context? 
I'd love to see the work that you've been doing up to now mm -hmm. because I think that's really great. If we can go along that route, it'd be brilliant. Um, can I ask you a question? Um, how have you actually managed to do that? Are you looking at uh, information that can be captured via computer or is this um, simply a sort of blank sheet that you add to? Uh, yeah, computer. I mean, computer. we've mainly been working, uh, well, the work we've done in cancer has been with mm -hmm. um, taking the medical record, well, essentially the computerized medical record, except that it wasn't computerized, we had to put it on the computer first. Um, but uh, so using a computerized record or using some sort of uh, on-computer interview of some sort. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's why I was wondering about the risk assessment mm -hmm. thing. I know I'm, I'm confusing the two different uh, nice uh, guidelines mm -hmm. here, but uh, um, you know, is there some sort of online questionnaire that could be developed? Is it the sort of thing that I patients answer or is it the sort of thing that, that is uh, done by the nurse or, or the other clinician? I, I, th I think it's something that could be done, but um, I'm aware of the limitations that we have within, uh, within healthcare. But it would be wonderful if we could have something that the patient filled out beforehand, um, put in their bits of medical history, which then could be extra uh, expanded on by the nursing staff and the medical staff, but would actually generate the information that you're requiring, you know, the, the risk factors, and giving them the information specific to those targets. I don't know how you think about it in community. I mean, the same, I, I would say as far as doing that sort of thing. Yes, it would be very, very useful if we could have that information prior to the patient being um, brought in to a hospital, a community hospital, or even into a district nursing caseload. Um, the difficulty is that many of the patients that are seen are seen during a, a part of their, their ill health where they really don't want to know about filling in forms or giving over questions they want to be looked after, they want to be cared for, and then that becomes the responsibility of the nurse to do that assessment. It is good to have pre-information, but I think that we have to realise that a lot of the patients that we do care for are very sick and, and, and want to be looked after, not, not overly questioned at that time. So I think we have to have some sensitivity over that. Thanks very much. I mean, it seems to be a conversation that might be worth carrying on with uh, mm. after the seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, very valuable indeed. And I mean, the slippers for me is yeah. <laughs> has hit home. Mm. Um, mm. If you can just mm. avoid, mm. Um, you know, a few people <laughs> going I, down I, with difficulties because yeah. of information with regards to That's slippers, right. for example. I, th I think there's a big issue there for health for healthcare providers, whoever they are, that precious oils have been seen as very unsexy. Um, and because they're bread and butter. Um, having said that, they shouldn't be. And sometimes we need to think a little laterally, and it's one of the problems that's been highlighted about risk assessment and sticking to pure numbers. Mm. We need to read around those issues. If you have a patient who's in your care who's had a spine injury and had rehab, we could think, oh, they're at very high risk, we'll put them on a dynamic mattress. Yes. The moment you do that, you actually reduce yes. their level of mobility. Yes. And in fact, mm. you make them more at risk. Yes. So it's being able to not only just do the assessment, but actually see where that fits within the whole care package. Mm. And, and that assessment has to be about the whole patient, not just one part of it. You've got to look at the whole patient. I think as TV, TVNs, one of the issues that we have is getting that educational point mm. across to healthcare providers. For mm. us to actually make sure that the information that is given out, whether it's in booklet form, whether it's on one-to-one -one interviews with patients, is actually relevant and that the nurses and doctors, mustn't forget those, and the physios and so on are actually targeting those areas. Mm -hmm. Certainly with my nurse educator hat on I can feel something interesting coming <laughs> along <laughs> with regards to the tissue viability and leg ulcer courses that we're, yeah. we're oh, currently yes. running mm -hmm. and uh, you know why not um, mm -hmm. consider looking at very different forms of assessment and assignment mm. for our students, mm. perhaps yeah. focusing mm. on um, some of the factors that, mm. that we've raised today. I mean that is a perfect opportunity because some mm. of the work that some people do on the EMB courses, they have, they have felt, well they've done the work and it's, it's then over. However, there have been a number of um, the district nurses that I, I've worked with and a couple have had their work published. Yes. And I think that that's helping them to move mm -hmm. forward. It's, it's something that helps them 
feel better about what they're doing and think, well, I made a difference. And at the end of the day, that's why we're all here mm. today. Yes. And that's why the nice guidelines have come up and that's why everybody's out there. Mm. We all want to make a difference. Mm. And I think that's an excellent point to call today's uh, seminar to a close. I'd like to offer my thanks uh, very much to Jenny for her most valuable presentation and to Martin and Maya for joining us today and really having some um, frank and full discussion. It's, it's been very useful. I'm sure everybody out there has, has thoroughly enjoyed it. It now leaves me to just remind you of a few of our forthcoming events. December the 12th, we have Bob Gann, who is the director of NHS Direct online with us, talking around NHS Direct and, and some of the relevant issues. January the 16th, we have Professor Mike Highland from the Department of Psychology with us, looking at new ways of thinking about complementary medicine. Also on January the 16th, we have Dr. Peter Drury with us, looking at an information strategy for the NHS. Those are just a few of our uh, nearest um, events. We have quite um, a list of planned events this year, and I would encourage you to keep your eye open for what's, what's coming up in the future and whether it is of interest to you. Thank you for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you next time. Safe journey home. Bye-bye.